Good morning and welcome everyone to this webinar series entitled Connecting Inquisitive Minds During Lockdown. I am Father Dr. Anil George Concord, IQAC coordinator. This webinar series is jointly organized by IQAC and the Department of Chemistry at St. Thomas College, an institution with a history of more than 100 years established in 1889. The alma mater of Padma Sri Dr. T. Pradeep, today's resource person. A college with rich legacy, passed several historical milestones, survived two world wars. Mahatma Gandhi visited himself the campus in 1927 inspiring the students to be part of independence struggle. The Maharaja in independence times, several presidents of India, several prime ministers of India, and Mother Teresa of Kolkata, such distinguished souls having visited the campus. Three former chief ministers of Kerala, the present education minister, they all are the alumni of St. Thomas College. The greatest wealth and feat of St. Thomas College is that the college is known through its daughters and sons, the alumni of St. Thomas College, stalwarts like Dr. T. Pradeep, Dr. Jamis, and so on. To welcome the resource person, the moderators, and the distinguished participants, we have the gracious presence of Bishop Tony Nilankavil, our beloved manager. Bishop Tony is also the auxiliary bishop of Archdiocese of Thrissur, who holds a PhD in theology from Catholic University Leuven, Belgium. He also had his research fellowship and research expertise at Dortmund Technical University, Germany. Formerly, he was the rector and professor at Mary Mother College Major Seminary in Trishu. Presently, he is also the chairman, Theological Commission, KCBC, Kerala Catholic Bishops Conference. A smiling face always, an inspiring presence. Welcome, Bishop Tony. I request you to welcome Dr. T. Pradeep, the moderators, and all the participants of this webinar series. Over to you, Bishop Tony. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Father Anil, for your kind words. Dear participants of the webinar series on connecting inquisitive minds during lockdown, which is uh, jointly organized by the Research and PG Department of Chemistry and the IQAC of St. Thomas College Autonomous Trichur. Father Anil has already introduced our college, of which we are really proud of. And I'm also very happy to see the faces of our prestigious alumni uh, today as resource persons talking to us from various parts of the world. As we all know, our world is undergoing a severe crisis affecting all normal activities of our everyday life. In fact, it's true that we have survived similar pandemics of chlora, uh, cholera, plague, influenza, and so on, even when the technology was not that developed. Now, we still, with all our new developments, we have confidence in human potentials which the Almighty has bestowed on us. With the advancements in modern science, we need to positively respond to the potentials given to us, even in this time of lockdown. With the development of uh, developments in technology and uh, standing together as one family, the world as one family, we will handle such crisis and recover 
normal activities of human life. This webinar series organized by the Department of Chemistry and the IQAC of St. Thomas College Autonomous Trichur is such an effort to bring back to normal academic activities in higher education sector and also positively contribute to overcome this, this present crisis. Uh, this inaugural lecture of the webinar series deals with a highly relevant topic, doing science with roots intact. And it is handled by one of the well-known academic and nanotechnologist, Patma Sri Professor T. Pradeep of IIT Madras, Chennai, who is, the, who is a distinguished alumnus of St. Thomas College. Uh, I'm very happy to note my personal contact with him for a few minutes or hour while we traveled together to visit a guru, both of us, three uh, great personality of three uh, Chitrandam Budiripad, great educationist, and also one of the most prestigious uh, alumnus of St. Thomas College. We together visited him and I found how uh, humble he was before his guru. And I'm sure he has also the same feeling towards St. Thomas College. This is perhaps the first occasion, uh, Dr. Pradeep, you join St. Thomas College for a program. Though we are staying in two different places after receiving Patmasri. And I'm also told you yourself shared with me that you were, you also received the prestigious Nikkei Prize from Japan quite recently. And in the name, we, we, I would like to express how proud we are of, of you, Dr. Pradeep. And in the name of this great audience whom we meet in this webinar, and also in the name of your alma mater as manager of this institute, May I extend to you hearty congratulations and a hearty welcome to this webinar. May Almighty God continue to bless you and guide you to greater heights. I'm also happy to meet other, uh, I'm also happy to see other alumni of our college. Dr. Kurian uh, is a, a very famous neurosurgeon who is now working in our Jubilee Medica Mission. Medical College professor and uh, practitioner there. I'm heard that more than 2000 participants have registered for this webinar. And finally, I would like to welcome all the participants whose face I don't see, but I'm sure you all are now uh, eagerly waiting to join this webinar series. Hearty welcome once again, I remain. Thank you. Hello, good morning to all. Thank you, Bishop Tony, for the nice welcome. I'm Dr. Joby Thomas, head of the Department of Chemistry and Vice Principal of St. Thomas College Autonomous Trishur. I'm happy to introduce the research person of the day, the Institute Professor of IIT Chennai, Patmasri Professor T. Pradeep, a prestigious alumnus of St. Thomas College. Professor Pradeep completed his studies from this institution in 1982-83. Nation has honored him by conferring Patmasri in the year 2020. Also, he is the recipient of Nikki Asia Prize, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, Sahitya Academy Prize, and several so on. The main brain behind this webinar series is Professor T. Pradeep. His interest, his concern about his alma mater is the backbone of this webinar series. And we are quite lucky to have his present for the inaugural lecture. Thank you and over to Professor Pradeep for the talk. I'm sharing my screen. Is this fine?
is this all right yes it is it's fine it's always a pleasure uh, to speak at a function organized by st thomas college it was uh, well st thomas college invited me uh, a few months ago when Patma Shri was announced. When I couldn't uh, make it, we are now in this lockdown. We decided to have a seminar series and the college invited me to start the, that series. So I'm thankful to the college, uh, the great minds at the college the institution which contributed to my career life in science. As, um, as we talk about science, for me, science is a, a totality. Science is not only chemistry that I do, material science that I do, it is physics, it is biology, it is all these inquisitive things, but beyond that, it is also literature, it's also fine arts. It is also to a large extent deeply rooted in our value system. All of these made me what I am. And therefore I chose to talk about doing science with roots intact. The roots that you see here, they are visible roots. But then there are a lot of roots, invisible. Invisible to the eye, invisible in the classroom if you were to sit only in the classroom, invisible if you don't get out. And for me, those invisible roots made me what I am. And this place, this St. Thomas College, which is centrally located in the cultural capital of Kerala. There are so many things that you can grow your invisible roots in just outside. So there is Sahiti Academy, there is Fine Arts, uh, there's also the Peking Garden Maidanam. There is also this uh, current corner. There's a national bookstall. A lot of these have built my life. And I am talking about those invisible roots. And today's generation, especially, is, is unsure or not adequately informed about those roots. And I would urge you to look at these invisible roots just outside, which I'm sure will build you better. So looking at this uh, college today, after 40 years, well, in fact, it is over 40 years when I first uh, went to St. Thomas College. Looking back today, this college is those invisible roots for me. And I will briefly touch upon those invisible roots in the course of this lecture. And then move on to my science, which made some lasting impact. I feel and many others feel lasting impact uh, on this society. I came from a place uh, having no electricity. And my younger days were till about uh, when I was till about 20 years of age, we didn't have electricity. I came, my childhood, uh, my primary school education, my school education, I read under a kerosene lamp and, and walked uh, four or five kilometers one way to my school. And that is the school uh, our bishop uh, talked about the person who built that school, uh, Mr. Chitranambu. So I came 
to this place in Thomas College. And at that time, well, what I recall are these great many people around my village, around my neighborhood, Viti Bhattadiripad, Kidasheri Govindan Nair, Akitam Achidan Nampudri. So all of these people, they're all my neighbors. And these people used to come home. In fact, Akitam was there for my marriage. Uh, and I came from that place. From that place, uh, of course, many other people also came. One thing that my father told me, my parents told me, which is important today to recollect, what he said was that nothing will ever fly above the written word. He emphasized this word nothing. You know, one day he was asking me, do you know what will be that on which nothing will ever fly? That, my boy, is word, written word. So I wish you the power of written word. And this is what I recall over many, many years, many, many occasions. He repeated the same thing, and you have to go after that. And even in his deathbed, he only advised me to go after that, don't worry about me. So fortunately, I had parents of that kind. And I had also people of this kind, as you, as you see in this picture. People in my region wrote, Kirtam wrote this. ഒരു കണ്ണീർക്കണം മറ്റുള്ളവർക്കായി ഞാൻ പൊഴിക്കവേ ഉദിക്കയാണ് ആത്മാവിൽ ആയിരം സൗരമണ്ഡലം ഫോർ ദോസ് ഹു ഡോണ്ട് റീഡ് മലയാളം ലെറ്റ് മീ ട്രാൻസ്ലേറ്റ് ആസ് ഐ ഷെഡ് എ ചിയർ ഫോർ അതേഴ്സ് ദേ റൈസ് വിത്തിൻ മീ എ തൗസൻഡ് സോങ്സ് കോഴ്സ് ഇഫ് യു വർക്ക് ഫോർ അതേഴ്സ് മെനി മെനി തിങ്സ് കം ടു യു ആൻഡ് ദാറ്റ് എൻ ലൈറ്റൻസ് യു ആൻഡ് ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് the power of a college in fact bishop talked about what bishop is part of that long tradition of people who shed tears for others and that is why i was in that college and today if you when i look back 40 years later i see those tears even more because i too build institutions uh, coming to this college as i walked on the road names appear these names were mentioned already uh, chief ministers uh, ems and uh, mondashiri in that uh, ministry as a minister of education and that's the menon people of this kind there are many other stalwarts you come into this college you are looking into people who built kerala who built the kerala value system and obviously you become part of that genealogy a, a line of thought and obviously you inherit lots of things for me those inheritances got me to activism in fact that was more romantic uh, and it is those days if you are not an activist obviously there is something wrong uh, about you that activism more of a, it was more of a, an idealistic uh, talked about an idealistic world and everyone was driven uh, by philosophy and many of those people are still around and i spend some time in collecting those pictures today if I look at this college and this is the college that uh, for me lots of people uh, their their past pictures and the current pictures are seen here but if you look at this this uh, college the huge college and the people around of course you connect yourself to a world outside that is what i i show here you connect yourself to academy sahitya academy 
or you connect yourself to finance, you connect yourself to Karen Corner or any of those, which obviously you get built. Of course, in the college, there were fantastic people. And uh, Professor K.P. Anthony was instrumental in me taking up uh, chemistry. I wanted to do Malayalam literature. But the classes of K.P. Anthony made me look at chemistry in, uh, in a different sense, different way. And he said, chemistry is everything. And that philosopher or philosophy of chemistry, he sort of symbolized uh, chemistry as philosophy. And he was in fact a chemical philosopher. And went on to Faru College where I had Shahid Latif. And I came to IIT Madras where I had Professor Manoharan. A lot of th these people together had years of wisdom and that of course poured into me and that built me because I was also built by this giant person uh, Professor Sienna Rao who even today uh, has this capacity of telepathic inspiration I can I can get him here at, at uh, you know if I if I wish uh, today telepathically and this is something that a power of a guru uh, can can only produce. St. Thomas is also not just a college, it's also a huge library. Uh, St. Thomas College Library was open all the time. So it was those days, the, at least the two years of my last two years of my BSc, it was fortunate that I read one book a day. It was possible because there was a giant library and there was also current corner and there was NBS. And one book that I read those days that I carry even today, that's the book that is uh, shown here and the writer of that book. So books of this kind, of course, take you to your value system, take you to your traditions and make you include every other value system as yours and therefore you become a better scientist. There's also a place where, where people of this kind lived. This is Sukumar Arikor, and a person whom I call, recall as a tsunami of words. And I went uh, wherever he, he spoke. Yeah, and it was a pleasure to hear him, not just hear him alone, all words of tsunami. They all were tremendously motivating. So if I look back today, what was St. Thomas College? What was that Kerala ecosystem uh, those days, 40 years back? That ecosystem is what made me do science of the kind that I do uh, today. Let me now switch uh, to that science. This science, I part of this lecture, I gave already uh, some days ago, and I have used uh, several of those slides here. This is about how chemistry, physics, materials can change water. And how, what one can do to ensure that water is clean. How can chemistry contribute to sustainable clean water? So for me, water is this, this beautiful pond, my neighborhood. This kind of neighborhoods exist everywhere in Kerala, at least many places in Kerala, in my neighborhood. This indeed exists today. But it is being threatened. But that threat is very much noticeable. If you go just about 13 kilometers from my home, so this is Bharatapura at Kutipuram, just after a few weeks after the monsoon. So you see a dry Bharatapura. That river is this 269 kilometer long river, longest river 
is, is many places, it is dry. And that dry river tells you about a story. Just about 40 years, 50 years ago, the river was not like that. The river used to carry water. Even today it carries water, it is for two weeks, but then it dries up. But those days it used to carry water for a long time. And in Dashiri Govind and Nair, our famous poet, in fact, I would say the first environmentalist of independent India, he wrote a beautiful poem called Kuchipuram Palam. Kuchipuram Palam was written in 1953. It was, uh, well, the bridge was not inaugurated for traffic. Uh, was but then construction was going on almost everything was over construction was started in 1947 or so the planning was going on even before that Vidashiri Govindan Nair wrote in the scripture from Palam see as I stand on this river and this bridge you Dila you river you will kneel under my legs. Dashiri was talking about the pillars of this bridge and he saw them as, 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 as legs of a human being, a monstrous human being with whose enormous capacity he would tame the river. And he then went on to say that if I make this progress, endless progress, you river, you will no more exist tomorrow. You will nothing be, you will not be this river, you will be filth. There will not be water to flow. He saw how civilization would transform our ecosystem. But those warnings were there even before the silent spring. Today, if you look, recall, uh, environmentalism, global environmentalism. This would be the first book that you would cite. Uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. He talked about the impact of pesticides, among other things. He talked about the impact the pesticides would have on the ecosystem. It was in 1962. And Kuchipuram Palam was, as I said, in 1953. There are, of course, very many writers who wrote about this. That takes you to this problem of water. Today, water is threatened because the whole water cycle, this hydrological cycle that we have, we have opened it. We meaning humans have opened it. If you look at that cycle, that cycle is nothing but this. It takes water plus carbon dioxide to sugar and oxygen. This is what is world's energy transporting engine. Sunlight fixes energy in the form of sugar. And we animals and us take this, take up this oxygen, the process of our, our living and sugar then convert that to water and carbon dioxide and produce energy and we run our engines. The energy well, transformation that we make for us to live produces CO2 as I just mentioned. We need to produce just 29 billion tons of CO2. It's all that we need to produce for us, not just us, the animal kingdom to live. But instead, Human beings use many other forms of sugar, well, not really sugar, the transformed sugar in the form of petroleum, we burn it and produce 258 billion tons of CO2. So our living produces 10 times more than what you ought to produce. It's not that we produce just CO2, we also produce many other things to produce nitric oxide, uh, nitrous oxide, uh, 
and no x we say not only that we produce sox sox and it is plants are not only producing sugar and oxygen they are producing alkaloids and terpenes and many other compounds as well but very small in quantity because of our activity we have opened the cycle we produce more of these and we have less of water and in addition we also produce many others which are not depicted here which contaminate water irreversibly so many people think that nanotechnology is a way forward for people to have sustainable clean water for a hungry planet there are many many things that one can do uh, in nanotechnology as you know water is not only chemistry there also physics there is also biology there is also material science there is also incubation it is everything so i do signs of that kind to ensure that water uh, can be clean so sometimes as you keep working in this area you wonder how this triatomic molecule can hide so much in itself so you look at this molecule uh, and and its complexity you look at all these motions of this uh, this water uh, on this this motion that you see this entire dynamics this entire thing is built into water this triatomic molecule possesses that capacity to act like this you wonder how is it possible but then nature has done so many things today water molecule itself is attracting a lot of attention uh, it is one of the most studied molecules even today in 2017 people look at uh, water people look at uh, you know image water so you, you see two kinds of water are sitting on a surface one is perpendicular another is parallel and uh, you, you form structures of this kind you understand very many details about water today we just just about uh, we know how h3o plus uh, transports protons people have people have understood or roughly understood how this transport occurs people have been in a position to see fundamental processes of, of this kind but if you look at water the large water that is present and you look at the ways to clean them you cannot forget the periodic table on the surface of uh, planet earth we see just alumina al2o3 aluminum trioxide or silicon dioxide or a few things of this kind in fact we see only elements of of the subtle element circle elements alone or compounds made of these on the surface it's because all the other elements by and large have dissolved in water they all produce ionic compounds which essentially dissolve in water and they end up in the ocean so today if you have to make clean water you need to sorry today if you have to make clean water you need to use only these elements which will not contaminate uh, the planet so you our science has looked at a large number of these uh, materials and uh, many of those materials in nanoscale form we studied in this great detail but in order to understand the kind of science of course we looked at the science of many other elements uh, compounds formed by many other elements uh, as well if you look at uh, indian realities uh, in clean water there are over 80 million people suffer due to arsenic over 130 million people suffer due to fluoride and uh, there are lot many other contaminants it is not just these alone there are new diseases coming as a result of several other contaminants 
something called chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology occurring as a result of uh, elements, heavy metals, as well as pesticides. And endocrine disrupting chemicals are plenty, many, many aspects. So if you look at all of these, I would like you to look at the statement of the World Health Organization. It reads like this, long-term exposure to arsenic from drinking water and food can cause cancer and skin lesions. It has also been associated with developmental effects, cardiovascular disease, neurotoxicity, and diabetes. What does this mean? You subject 80 million people of the country suffer due to arsenic and make them prone to all of these, how can you say that they are equal? Where is liberty? How can their children, they themselves, fight along with you? They don't have equal opportunities. So there is an ethical reason for you to work on clean water. But there are many other aspects around water. We worked on new adsorbents, which can contaminate, which can remove contaminants from water. And they are all in these very many forms, nanoparticles, nanotubes, graphene, polymers, and 2D materials. There are, using such materials, you can develop new sensors using several phenomena. You can, you can develop new catalysts. You can develop new phenomena using new materials. And all of these can be used to create new devices. So that subject area is called aqua nanotechnology. And uh, we do make several, you know, that, that this is a recent book, not very recent, over 500 and odd pages of that. Now there are several others who work in this area. There are journals in this area, there are more books in this area. If you look at uh, that subject, you also see that the power of instrumentation has advanced tremendously. So today, nanoparticles can be seen by an optical microscope. So this is dark field scattering spectrum, scattering image of uh, a collection of silver nanoparticles. They all are showing different colors because they scatter differently. They scatter, uh, ultimately, they scatter in different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, and therefore you get different colors. Now, what I wanted to say was that an individual nanoparticle can be seen today by an optical microscope, and that means that a lot of spectroscopy can be done at a single particle level to understand how particles behave. You'll see in the course of this lecture that you can put the single particle inside a bacterium and ask the question how the particle behaves. And it is also possible that a single particle can interact with the DNA and you can ask this question how it behaves. So power of instrumentation has advanced tremendously. So on the one side, you have nanoparticles of a few tens of nanometers that can be seen under an optical microscope, you have highly powerful electron microscopes with which you can see atoms. So this is a column of molybdenum and sulfur atoms of a molybdenum sulfide nanoscale sheet imaged. And I can see the kind of scale bar. You are seeing distances of a few angstroms. Now it is also possible that you can create molecules of gold like these is not necessarily a molecule of, uh, well, this is a small nanoparticle, you may say. You can measure the mass spectrum of that. That means that you can, this is the only thing that is there in that solution. That's what is mass spectrum telling me. And therefore, we can crystallize this. And you can understand the properties of these in great detail. So with all that, you can create advanced nanomaterials. This advanced nanomaterials with tremendous capacity that you have to understand the science, you can apply for applications. So one thing that we did 
was something like this. The application is translating to a product. So here is a um, World Bank assisted Mark II pumps earlier generation. So this is called a cast iron pump. This is not a World Bank assisted Mark II pump. Uh, it's about 40 years old pump. And that pump is sitting on a cemented platform in a district called Navia in West Bengal. Water is coming from a depth of about 50 to 80 feet. And this boy is pumping that. Each stroke of this pump is producing 300 ml of water. And in this region, normally this water comes out with iron. And that iron stain is what is seen here on this cement platform. If you see iron along with it, there can be arsenic. And the arsenic concentration here is of the order of 120 ppb parts per billion or micrograms per liter. That is 10 microgram per liter is the limit of arsenic. So these people are drinking contaminated, arsenic contaminated water. So what is the solution? Of course, this problem has been there for ages. We knew about this problem for over 106 years globally. People have investigated that in arsenic poisoning for that many years. But solutions did not come. Solutions did not come because they are not affordable. And people, most of the people who suffer due to poisoning of this kind, they are poor. Now, with advanced materials that we have made in the laboratory, we can produce a contraption of this kind. It has about seven kilograms of this material put here that we have developed and many others are also there to remove many other contaminants. So the one stroke of this pump gives you 300 ml of clean water now. It is US EPA quality water. Environmental Protection Agency quality water or WHO quality water below two parts per billion of arsenic. And it can, this pump can work and deliver 1,000 liters of water a day. And three strokes of this pump will give you one liter of water a day, which means that every school you can put this and 300 kids in the school will all get clean water during the interval time, just about less than 10 seconds they need to pump to get one liter of water. So we in installed this across. So this is a small unit. Of course, it has gone on to several scales. 1,000 liters in water a day, 36, you know, 360,000 liters of water a year, about 600,000 liters of water in two years. So that's the kind of capacity of this filter and the cost of that is under two paisa per liter. So that is great. Nanomaterials can do a lot of things. Of course, this is not the only thing that you can do. You can do advanced nanomaterials of the kind that I just showed you about small nanoparticles, which are 25 atoms of gold or things of this kind can be incorporated into plastics, uh, into membranes. And as a result, uh, when they are incorporated, this membrane will be luminescent if you radiate ultraviolet light on that. And this is now made of small fibers, nanoscale fibers of this kind, very tiny fibers. And these fibers are impregnated with these uh, particles. And as a result, the membrane looks like this to this naked eye. Now, if you put a contaminant on it, this membrane will change color. So here is what happens on the fiber when you put a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of mercury, this is what happens. Of course, you can develop sensors of this kind. A mobile phone can read that change, and therefore, you can measure the concentration of contaminant in water. So that's one kind of thing. So we have made several materials. So this is a material which is called a composite material. Uh, and this composite material has pores. There are pores in, in, in these. And if you put dirty water through, you can get clean water as a product. And many people have written about it. 
So if you look at drinking water, there are 92 species regulated in drinking water, and 21 of those species are halogenated organics, and 15 species are metals, etc. There are many species getting regulated. Many of these species are regulated at very low concentrations and nanoparticles can handle all of these at low concentrations. So long, long ago, uh, this was my first patent. And uh, using this patent, we removed pesticides from drinking water using nanoparticles. And so today, that has reached a lot of people. And uh, in this material, the new thing that I just told you about, we make we introduce a new concept. So that is that many materials that we use in clean water for producing clean water are made in water. Although they are made in water, uh, well, made in water, of course, what it means is that in the course of this production, water gets contaminated. Because you get clean, you get the pure material out, and that material is used to produce clean water. So effectively, it is producing clean water. Of course, it has also contaminated water in the course of its production. After its useful life cycle, it goes back to the field and again it contaminates water. So you ask the question, how much of really, how much of water did it really produce? Total water produced minus total water that was contaminated, which is oftentimes negative. So we ask this question, can we have water positive materials? One liter of water produces 100 liters of clean water. That material is made in one liter of water, it contaminated one liter of water, but it produced water, clean water, 1000 liters or 100 liters of water. So today we have such materials, water positive materials, and they are synthesized in water. They are synthesized at room temperature, they are, although synthesized in water soluble form or starting from water soluble form, they are water stable. And by all these, they qualify as green materials. Now, if you have to look at a water soluble material from which synthesis happens at room temperature, and finally you get insoluble materials, it is almost like mating, making uh, seashells. Seashells are made with carbon carbonate and calcium and some proteins and things of this kind. And finally, you get an insoluble material stays for ages. In fact, we can produce such materials. What are soluble materials and finally make water insoluble materials and the whole synthesis happens at room temperature and they are nanostructure. So if you start looking at them, they are like they are like producing matchboxes. If you look at it in great detail in, under a microscope, you get a picture which is having sheets, two sheets like that, two sheets like that, two sheets like that. It's like six sheets, and you can imagine that is like a matchbox. And within that matchbox, which is having a nanometric dimensions uh, inside, and you can put a nanoparticle inside. And water can pass through that cage and get cleaned and clean water will go out, the contaminant will get uh, retained. This kind of a, a process can be uh, developed. It is also possible uh, that this kind of materials can be mass produced. Not just one kind of nanoparticle, many different types of nanoparticles can be put uh, into such cages. So here is an example. Let us put some silver nanoparticle inside then what happens is that water goes in silver ions get into water and how much of silver ions very tiny bit 50 parts per billion and 50 parts per billion of silver ions can destroy bacteria viruses and things like that but then this can happen with any nanomaterial any silver nanomaterial but any silver nanomaterial of course will produce silver ions in water at room temperature but just after a few hours or a few days, when it is exposed to water, uh, the silver ion concentration will decrease. And it is not going to be like that. It will, it will go on decreasing. And when it goes below 25 parts per billion, silver is no more antimicrobial. So as a result, the silver nanoparticle technology doesn't work 
if it is particles are directly exposed to water. Now, in this particular case, particles are not directly exposed to water. As a result, contaminants don't come and sit on the silver part. What are those contaminants? Typically, there are silicates in water. Calcium silicate is one major contaminant that can deposit on a silver nanoparticle. Even with a very tiny layer of contaminant that is sitting on the surface, you will destroy the surface activity. The silver ions will not come out. So as a result, this material will not be effective. Our material is effective not only, you know, as you can see, it is we don't do experiments with one liter or 10 liters of water. We run experiments with thousands of liters of water, which sees, it shows that it's a drug-like release of metal ions happening. As a result, bacteria, live bacteria get dead. And you can see whether nanoparticles are getting into these uh, bacteria or not, it is important to study because nanotoxicity is a major concern. So if you take bacteria and load them with nanoparticles directly, uh, you can see the nanoparticles with spectroscopy of the kind that I mentioned before. But in our case, although the nanoparticles are there, they are embedded in the cages. Only silver ions come out, no nanoparticle comes out and bacteria get dead and uh, you can see this what is called bacterial lysis but no nanoparticle get uh, released you can construct a contraption here is a contraption that has been made you can put water through it and get silver ions into water and that uh, of course destroys bacteria many other nanomaterials can be put in there and uh, you can remove contaminants such as arsenic so you put in bacteria input concentration you ask what is the output concentration you put metal ions, lead, etc., or arsenic. What is the input concentration? What is the output concentration? So this is how you do a prototype development. You also develop new materials. So in the earlier materials, as I told you, you don't have, uh, well, you, you had cages of the kind that I just told you. So here is a material which is amorphous to begin with. High resolution microscopy of this kind doesn't show any particles. But a little later on, when electron beam irradiates this material for some time, you get nanoparticles are crystallized inside and they are very tiny crystals, so about three, four nanometers in diameter. And these such crystallites uh, tell us that there are amorphous materials here. And these amorphous materials are iron oxyhydroxide. And these iron oxyhydroxides are very good for removing arsenic. So you put 200 parts per billion of arsenic, five plus and three plus, these are the two ions of arsenic present. And you ask what is the output concentration? Here is the output concentration below two ppb. And you can construct a contraction like this, just about 30, 20, 30 grams of this material. So you can filter about water, 1,200 liters of water. After passing that many liters of water, arsenic concentration, of course, goes above the limits. Now, that is the limit of this material. You can also make a house contraption passing 6,000 liters of water, 10 liters of water for a family per day. So that means about uh, 4,000 liters per year. So we run this uh, for 6,000 liters, typically uh, considering the safety margin, etc. So we have products of this kind. How would these guys work? So we can do spectroscopy. So this is what you see is Raman spectroscopy to say that on an iron oxyhydroxide, how a specific arsenic species sits. This is arsenate and this is arsenide. How these species sit on the surface uh, can be understood. Using that, you can model it. You can take a nanoparticle and you can ask this question, how would arsenide and arsenate sit on the surface? So one number of studies can be done on very many contaminants of this kind. So using this, now you can translate. So typically in the field, you have large uh, plants of this kind about supplying water for about 2000 people. And typically this plant uh, dimension is about 40 cents of land, several cages, several vessels of this kind having alumina, uh, which uh, have very less absorption capacity and uh, not only absorption capacity, uh, you, you don't get performance of the kind that I just told you about. 
Now, because these materials have large capacities, the 40 cents of land area can be shrunk to five cents of land area. And you can construct devices of this kind, which produce something like 200,000 liters of water uh, a day. And that is what is needed uh, for that kind of communities. So we have now established these across different regions of the country. Now this is in Punjab. So what uh, happens, people would ask this question, what, what is the cost? The cost is 2.1 paisa per liter, not only consumable cost, but also all the capital cost combined. So this is the kind of uh, cost that is needed today. And we install smaller units across different regions, as I just told you about. So in such units also, we monitor water arsenic concentration. Not only we monitor, the public utilities monitor arsenic concentration uh, before and after. We install units of this kind. These units are now, uh, well, this is a recent installation of 83 units. And I'll show you a video of that at a cost of this. And they are together supplying 10 million liters of water every day. And that is the kind of technology development we do. Of course, a uh, lot of problems exist in the field. There is diverse water quality. There is a lot of spent media. The sludge has to be managed. Reactivation, um, weather conditions, uh, accessibility of, uh, of these sites. All of these are important uh, and they all have to be addressed to ensure that the technology works in the field for the poor. So on the one side, there can be adsorption technologies which don't require any power at all uh, for contaminant removal. We also have technologies wherein ions are removed by electricity. So this is called capacitive deionization. So there are two electrodes here, positively charged and negatively charged electrodes, typically made of carbon and advanced carbon. If you charge them with, let us say, one kind of potential, positive and negative, oppositely charged ions uh, get absorbed on them. And as a result, you can get uh, desalinated water. And typically, you don't have one electrode assembly. You have many electrodes. And you construct that in the form of a battery uh, cell. And finally, you get uh, products. And that's a company that has been set up to produce uh, products of this kind. And this is important in several areas of uh, coastal India where seawater intrusion is significant and uh, salinity is very high. There are also places where you get a lot of sunlight. So it is possible that this kind of units can be constructed and, and can be made to work in solar light, solar power, and we have such units functional in villages. They can also be coupled with, uh, with IoT. Uh, information communication technology. As a result, you know whether the unit is functional or not in the field. So while they are available, it is also important to know water quality. So we can develop a number of sensors of this kind. So we develop sensors, although they are not put in the field, you can connect them to mobile phones and measure water quality. So this is one such thing developed by somebody else. Uh, this is white size, where you can have materials using them you can, you can develop uh, electrochemistry-based sensors and uh, electrochemistry can also be observed or the data can be collected over a mobile phone. Of course, this can connect to the internet. So tomorrow, water purifiers of the kind that we have at home can have sensors. Even today we have sensors, but there are affordable sensors and which can give you all of these parameters and all of these data are coming from global installations across the world and utilities across the world. And using that, it is possible to predict health quality in addition to water quality globally. There are a number of other materials. It is not just these alone globally. There are new nanostructures for water harvesting. There are new materials for sustainable release of minerals into water. There are new metal organic frameworks and their applications, you know, they, they are used to harvest water, humidity from air. There are nano holes and 2D materials and a number of things. And I'll show you a few examples of these. So in the laboratory, we produce very fine, hairy objects of this kind using a technology called electrospray deposition. 
So this is called electrospray. Using that, we deposit metal ions, and using them, we create nanostructures of this kind. So what is good about this? Such nanostructures are very much similar uh, to structures that you have uh, on cacti, on many plants. And uh, so these are our cacti, and these structures are the ones that you make in the laboratory. They can harvest humidity. And this is, biology uses these. And many beetles harvest humidity like these over nanostructures. So using these, we can harvest water. Uh, so let us say we have a surface over which surface, such uh, interesting nanostructures are created and they are cooled and air is drawn to that surface. Humidity gets condensed and you get collect water and we have now a company called YU Gel Technologies. So that water having it has no, no minerals. So you can deposit minerals in them just like minerals from rocks. So we have selective dissolution of minerals and for which advanced materials are made. I mentioned to you about 2D materials. So these are one dimension, two dimensional materials having a thickness of one atom. So these are very tiny membranes and you can make holes in them. So this is a MOS2 tiny sheet. MOS2 is like grease, like graphite, uh, which is a greasy material. And uh, you can have holes in them. And these holes uh, can be observed with the microscopy. This is a two dimensional uh, sheet, as I told you. And uh, this is highly ordered. You can have small holes in them. And these are the tiny holes that you see. So these holes have uh, an interesting property. Now, if you look at these holes in great detail, at the surface of these holes, you see only molybdenum atoms. So these are molybdenum rich holes. So what is so great about this? These molybdenum rich holes, if you expose them to sunlight in water, they produce hydrogen peroxide. So using such hydrogen peroxide, you can destroy bacteria. So this is bacterial destruction that you see, live bacteria become dead. So not only that, it can destroy bacteria, it can also, well, virus can be deactivated as is shown in this particular image. So you can create such holy MOS to deposit them on a surface and uh, irradiate them with uh, sunlight or artificial sunlight, pass contaminated water containing bacteria and viruses, you get uh, bacteria free water. And that's a concentration of bacteria to begin with. And that's a concentration after five cycles of operation. So which means that completely uh, harmless disinfection, so to say, environmentally friendly disinfection is possible by these methodologies. So you have a lot of new science. These science can lead to, are based on phenomena of the kind. And these materials and phenomena combined, we can create new technologies. I showed you about this technology with arsenic removal, this technology about capacity deionization, and this technology about atmospheric water harvesting. It's not this alone. People do a number of new possibilities. So this is something called clathrate hydrates. These are clathrates are, uh, are gas hydrates. Chlorine hydrate was the first clathrate hydrate that was discovered by, uh, by Davy long, long ago. But today we make hydrates that are methane hydrates. Methane hydrates are, are, are ices which can burn uh, in your hand. That is, methane is trapped inside cages of water and that becomes a solid. And that solid is at a fairly low temperature. And methane can come out of it, you can burn it. So people store gases as hydrates. But when you store gases as hydrates, what happens is that water, you know, when the hydrates go out, you have ice and the ice, if you met, is water. And that water is clean water. So let us say hydrates are formed with seawater. Then what happens is that seawater is saline water, but when the hydrates are formed, you have only pure water in the form of hydrate. So take the gas out, take also the clean water out. This kind of methodology is today possible. In fact, incidentally, we discovered gas hydrates in interstellar atmosphere in one of our other research themes with a colleague called uh, Rajneesh Kumar. 
and this is my student called Yodhir uh, Mayakosh. So we can, uh, somebody from NUS, uh, his name is Pravin Linga, he uses this methodology of taking seawater, making gas hydrates, and these gas hydrates, you take gas out and then take clean water. So this whole process is today possible and it is especially useful uh, for Kerala. There are many other things that people do. Rahul Nair, another product from Kerala, is, uh, is working in Manchester. He uses graphene or graphene oxide based nano sheets. And here is one such thing uh, that he does. He makes controllable pores well, pores can be sort of manipulated or they can be made smart. And he shows that it is possible to, by controlling electrical potential, you can make water flow through these pores or stop water flow. Somehow this video is not really working, uh, but it is possible that water can be, yes, water can be flown through that or water flow can be stopped uh, through that depending upon the potential uh, that you apply. So these are excellent nanotechnology applications uh, for uh, desalination. Let me move on. Um, but this is not the only thing that people do. Uh, so there are here this is uh, Karna Suresan from Aisar Tiruvarantapuram. He does something of this kind. So he has materials of nanoscale materials of this kind. These materials can absorb oil as in oil spills in sea. And you see, this is a traditional material. Uh, no, this is a traditional material. This is his material. And if I move this uh, video further, you will see uh, that Although the same amount of uh, oil was put in here, you can remove the, all the oil completely. And in this particular case, oil is not removed completely. Such materials can also be used for water harvesting. There are many, many other applications I did not have time to tell you about, but that is only about clean water. Clean water is a very tiny segment of the national water need. There is a whole lot of other water. So look at the amount of water that is flowing through Ganges and its tributaries and the kind of uh, activity, human activities that we do on this. And water is increasingly getting threatened. And it is so shocking to see that only one third of the sewage that in our country is treated. This is the largest, this is the kind of sewage that we have and this is the amount that we treat. So there is, these are million liters per day, and these are huge quantities that we have. Now, <clears throat> in a country like ours, 70% uh, of the water is used for agriculture. 67% of Indian agriculture is run on groundwater. It's not on, run on surface water. So all of these are causing tremendous stress uh, on the water bodies. So if you have to solve water problem, of course, agriculture has to be solved. Water is not just water alone. Water is health. Water is air. Water is agriculture, as I just mentioned. Water is the entire ecosystem. So if you want to look at water problem in greater detail, many other aspects have to be looked at. You have to look at clean air. You have to look at sustainable agriculture. That, of course, leads to quality food. And all of these would mean global partnership is uh, required. So in chemistry, of course, you can clean water. But you, can you not do better chemistry to ensure that water is not polluted at all? So that is green and sustainable chemistry. How about green sustainable agriculture so that we don't use overuse pesticides? We don't use overuse fertilizers. It's not just this. Water is also used in construction. A friend of mine tells me that 15% of Indian, Indian construction or water use is in construction. 15% of pure water is used in construction. The way India is growing goes more and more water for construction. So that adds uh, to an enormous impact uh, on water bodies. How about uh, new materials which would require less water for construction? Unfortunately, we know only one type of cement which uses or which needs that much of water uh, for its stability. 
are new materials. Of course, in today's uh, situation, we are talking about detergents, but there are many other materials that are being used. They all have huge environmental impact. Uh, water quality has to be measured with advanced sensors. Is it not possible to develop sensors which can be attached to a water bottle? And just by, you know, shooting or let's say pointing your uh, mobile phone at that sensor, you get water quality measured and that gets connected uh, to internet and cloud and uh, big data. So all of these tells you that completely different kind of science is needed and that science of chemistry today, of course it overlaps into many other disciplines and therefore people say that that science is central science. And in that, chemistry at the interfaces become really important. A lot many areas wherein you can make impact. Um, I did not talk about this particular problem, number two. So that is, if you are looking at desalination, desalination globally produces about 76 million tons of CO2. Desalination contributes that much. Is it not possible that this entire CO2 can be converted to methanol. In fact, we use about 76 million tons of methanol a year. Can we not convert the CO2 to methanol? It is indeed possible. That was a slide that I did not tell you that it is possible today to convert CO2 to methanol uh, efficiently with new nanoscale catalysts. It is also possible that water, a lot of water is being produced uh, in your homes or point of use. Can that water be recycled with new, new technologies? There are many new technologies that are known. New desalination, can we not have? We are putting a lot of detergents and plastics into uh, our water bodies. Can we not audit the impact of environmental cost of these products? And if you have those, that kind of audit done, it is possible that consumer products will be costing differently and uh, new kind of consumer products will, will be produced, which will have less impact on the environment. There are nanotech enabled water infrastructure is possible, meaning that it is possible that you can have advanced sensors uh, deployed on water utilities and it is possible uh, that water distribution can be managed differently. I told you about sensors on a water bottle. Many different such sensors are possible. And this entire science can expand into clean air. Why can't we remove contaminants from air, dust, pollutants? It is possible. And therefore, by doing all that, biodiversity can be preserved. Many people say that about 80% of all the aquatic life, freshwater aquatic life has disappeared in the past nearly 30 years because of contamination. So there is a lot of work that has to be done to protect biodiversity. Nanotechnology can help in that. So nanotechnology can also help in conservation. You are talking about a lot of water going into water, uh, going to soil. Can it be conserved uh, by nanotechnology? I also talked about harvesting possibility from air, the lot more harvesting, recycling, auditing possibilities. So when you start thinking about sustainable clean water, of course you have development as a result of, of the cause of human aspirations, uh, because of increasing population, a lot of stress is put on water. And you can produce a lot of uh, different technologies to produce uh, clean water. You have a large number of other associated technologies also, it all will help you in producing sustainable clean water. But ultimately, sustainable clean water has to look at limits to growth because the amount of water on this planet is limited. And if all of these people have to use that water, well, then we have to think about conservation. We have to limit ourselves to water utility. We cannot afford to grow the rice grow rice the way that we are growing, using about 2000 liters of water per kilogram of rice. Uh, we have to find new ways. So that needs global partnership. So we have built a new center called the International Center for Clean Water 
where anyone can come and innovate a water technology and take that with them. So this is a completely new initiative of IIT Dross. We also have put in water technologies in the field. Of course, ultimately, the benefit of all of these uh, effort is that you see it in the field and people uh, use it. Of course, all of these have become possible because of people. Some of these people have built companies. Uh, there are many others who have built and they are not part of the group, part of that picture. This is my larger group. We work on different themes uh, around water, around materials, around chemistry, around biology, around uh, um, instrumentation. So a lot of things are being done. And this is our new laboratory with the Institute uh, constructed. It's a very nice place and uh, nice to be there. I have a movie to show you, but I don't have time uh, now. And therefore I will skip this. And I must tell you, that this science has been possible because of a lot of people. They have built companies. Uh, and it is not just my effort alone. The government has supported tremendously in this. And my institution has been behind this initiative. I must also tell you that when a student builds a company, it's not that the student builds a company. The student goes after a company or goes after an idea when the parents are convinced about it. And the parents in an IIT system, of course, a kid can have a job in Microsoft or Amazon or something. But instead of that, they chose to work on water. And that is because parents have been supportive of that initiative. So I should thank them as well. And uh, my new initiative has resulted in this International Center for Clean Water. And that is a center that you can all visit. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you all. Let us take questions now. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep, for sharing your experiences as a student, faculty, and researcher. I'm sure it has motivated many young minds to look at science beyond textbooks and serve the nation at large. We have quite a number of questions from students studying in school, in college, and further on. Even faculty members are participating in this webinar. So the first question is, sir, can you kindly tell us about the person or persons who inspired you the most to reach up the highest level of science, particularly chemistry. Thank you. Well, I'm. <laughs> I'm speaking from St. Thomas College, or speaking on behalf of St. Thomas College, a function organized by St. Thomas College. Uh, I mentioned about this person who motivated me tremendously. This college. Uh, his name is K.P. Anthony. Uh, my teachers. But then, if you were to expand that further, a question. of all who motivated. There is one single person that's quite difficult to point out. But in St. Thomas, I would say my teachers have been phenomenal. OK, shall we move on? OK, yeah, sure. sure. So I so, ask. Dr. Joby Thomas K, our HOD, to ask the next question. Thank you, sir. Sir, thank you. Thank you for your uh, nice presentation. It is very, very informative how technology can be transferred to the public. And there is a question regarding the arsenic removal. As you said, in the village of West Bengal, there was there were uh, any attempt to correlate the health issues before and after connecting the filter removal of arsenic from water. 
you have mentioned that uh, there is a filter institute there and what is the impact effect so there have been several studies uh, of impact of health on people now the number of uh, people falling sick has decreased number of students who uh, who are not attending uh, the school that has decreased uh, there were health benefits of this kind but longer term health benefits in terms of the number of people getting a reduce I mean, reduction in the uh, people falling sick from health uh, center data from health centers such uh, statistics have not been compiled across states there have been very limited um, localized efforts in this regard this is something that has to be done thank you sir thank you sir father anil kongat vilas thank you very much sir for the wonderful exposition uh, this is regarding you know uh, two questions one is regarding water water scarcity is going to be one of the difficult uh, situations in the coming years so the water from the sea there are different technologies that can be used will that be a uh, you know an excellent solution from the point of nanotechnology and where there will be any disadvantages for that that is the first question second question uh, the medical field what will be the application when it comes to you know the di uh, dialysis and things like that can you say something on that thank you so as far as um, desalination is concerned as you said there are several nanotechnology based solutions the major one of course is uh, is membrane based solution new kinds of biologically uh, active membranes called aquaporin incorporated membranes are coming in which uh, reduce well these membranes reduce the power consumption significantly there are still challenges there uh, there are thermal desalination methods again using nanotechnology uh, there are new kinds of membranes that are coming in i showed one video of that ultra fast extremely efficient membranes are coming so all of these uh, will make uh, cheaper desalination feasible but desalination always requires power so we can only reduce power but power is needed uh, and that power can come from sunlight that power can come from geothermal energy there are different ways by which that can that can come there also there is a a lot of nanotechnology based solutions impact of these uh, there also you know when you say take water from sea and uh, remove salt and uh, send back this very same water which is rich in salt back to sea there are local environmental effects uh, in the sea and that is that also has to be contained so if you start looking at uh, desalination as a larger problem of course this can this has to be implemented with considering all of these issues into uh, consideration in our case uh, what was your second question it's about medical field medical dialysis field. and things so like um, so there is a lot more that you know membrane related nanotechnology can do uh that is happening uh, and there itself i told you about touched upon this uh, gas hydrate based technology uh, this technology tomorrow is going to be very useful for kerala this is quite an important thing uh, you know there is something called cold energy uh, cold energy is nothing but you are getting gas gas is coming in the form of uh, in in cryogenic containers and when gas is used gas is used as gas for which you have to heat up this uh, cold cryogenic fluid uh, lpg it is it is in low temperature you are using it at room temperature 
So this energy is called cold energy. So that is energy is used to evaporate this uh, fluid to gas. Now, if that energy is coming from water itself, water will get cooled. In that process, you can produce gas hydrates. And that gas hydrate can actually be used to clean, produce clean water. So the cold uh, water, cold energy terminals in Kerala can actually be used to produce clean water. It's a great possibility for the country. So a lot more this kind of technologies are coming. Coming to your point of, uh, of what one can do for dialysis and things like that, people are having new capacity deionization technologies which can produce clean water at home in a dialysis machines. So it is possible that home-based dialysis can involve new nanotechnology solutions much more effectively and make this product affordable. In fact, a prototype is being developed at IIT Madras itself. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I thank uh, Professor Joby, Professor Jones, and other organizers of this webinar. Uh, Patmasri Professor T. Pradeep Kumar is a close friend of mine, a 40 year old relation, and is just Pradeep to me. We had a very la la good time in the college. He was a strong activist interested in politics in the first one and one and a half years. Slowly we recognized the genius in him. He was not a genius. He was just above that. And you know the combination. Which made him this is a combination of this genius and hardworking a very rare combination. And he now is progress to such high levels and you know the lot of work he is doing in the field of nanotechnology and water. Uh, for the first year he had a very tough time in college traveling one hour, one and a half hours to the college and later he stayed in the hotel in the hostel and uh, then he then his career was just changing. The few important characters which you note in Pradeep is one is his sincerity. It's a very if he, he keeps uh, close contacts with his friends whenever he comes to Trichur, he makes point to contact many of them. He can contact contact me sometimes and I've been to his uh, camber, campus in IIT and his uh, lab. I uh, visited his lab when I was in Chennai. His other, other, other very good qualities is keep close contacts with his professors and uh, take take parts in webinars or some meetings involved in his uh, with professors, especially with uh, Professor T. P. Anthony, and uh, he, and now he's giving back what he has learned from his college to the students, and uh, he's, he's be always been a great friend of us and let its service to the community, to the world, continue in the field of nanotechnology and water. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. I don't have any specific questions. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. There is one of our uh, former student, former faculty, and now he is the, uh, currently he is the registrar of University of Calicut. Dr. Joshi CL, he is attending from his office from the very beginning and I request Dr. Joshi CL to say a few comments and ask any questions. First of all, very uh, a nice presentation from the part of Dr. Pradeep. Almostly Dr. Pradeep is a forerunner to me and always an inspiration to me. That is the I have to say. He is really uh, proud to the St. Thomas College and also to the University of Calicut. I have one question, sir. Uh, it's a very nice presentation and all the best for you. And I want one question for that is uh, how you can help Calicut University because we need a large quantity of water to be purified. And how can you uh, uh, help me? Or help the university to purify the large quantities of water that is 
Well, uh, it's fantastic. In fact, this, this question I can expand further and uh, and ask: How can we be water sufficient uh, in? We get five percent, point five percent more water on our land area than the water that we evaporate from land. 0.5% more water falling on the land in the form of rain than the water we evaporate. Okay, you got the point. This water is what drives society, civilization, everything. This water 0.5% falls on the land and then go, runs down to the sea. And that 0.5% makes all the civilization, all the development, all activities. Many societies keep that water. We don't have a capacity. We don't make enough. We don't store enough. Calicut University and the state of Kerala suffer just because we don't keep that water. Now, you produce, you have average rainfall of so much of rainfall. You know, something of the order of in Chennai, we get about 1400 millimeters of rain. Kerala, you get about 2200 or so. Huge amount of rainfall. Now, we are going to have a monsoon. This university should ensure that all the water falls on the university campus. Please conserve it. And this, if you do for three years continuously, it is not difficult at all. Very, very easy thing. In fact, I was talking to people. They have central government has allocated money for it. 40,000 crores for it. Money is already available. So if we conserve that. We do this for three years. I tell you, Calicut University campus, Penjipalam campus will be water well surplus. And for which I can, what is that I can do, right? I can collect all the rainwater experts of the country. This is available. And Calicut University, if please take a lead, we could do so. And it is not just Calicut University alone, everyone, including my parental home, should do this. Thank you. Thank you, okay, Dr. Sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, now we have. Dr. Joy Kael, our beloved principal, uh, who is closely attending this webinar from the very beginning. And interestingly, he happens to be from the Department of Chemistry as well. Dr. Joy, please make your comments. Thank you. Sir, good afternoon to all. Sir, um, respected Parpasri, Professor T. Pradeep, and distinguished guests, and my dear colleagues and participants. First of all, I Thanks, sir, for this uh, webinar. is very informative and uh, enriching session, sir. Uh, sir Thomas College Autonomous Trishur has a long tradition of being the pioneer in higher education in Kerala. This webinar series is an important step by the college to bring various inquisitive minds together to discuss the academic issues relevant to higher education in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. We are proud to have Palmasri Professor T. Pradeep sir with us, a distinguished alumnus of the college who inspired people, especially younger generations, to do science with roots intact by the inaugural lecture in this webinar series. Thank you, sir. I am extremely happy to know that there are more than 2,000 participants, including eminent scientists, academics, educationists, head of institutions, policy makers from India and abroad attending this webinar. I truly acknowledge this initiative by the chemistry department and IQC and wish all the success to this webinar. Hello. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have almost uh, gone beyond one and a half hours. Yes, sure. Our discussions definitely will continue in different forums. I. Thank you all, especially I invite Dr. Joseph Jolie, the convener, to make some concluding remarks and uh, uh, propose word of thanks. Thank you. 
respected dignitaries and dear participants it was a nice story about uh, water and uh, we are coming to the end of the first inaugural lecture of the webinar series connecting inquisitive mind during lockdown and uh, i am sure that it was a new experience to many of you listening to the exciting lecture by patmashri professor t pradeep through a webinar platform on behalf of the organizing committee i express our sincere gratitude to professor pradeep for such a wonderful motivating talk now i would like to thank all the distinguished guests namely mar toni nilangavil auxiliary bishop of trishur arch diocese and the manager of st thomas college trishur uh, professor sebastian c peter who was supposed to join uh, this webinar Dr. C. L. Joshi, Registrar, University of Calicut; Principal, Dr. K. L. Joy; I. Q. S. E. Coordinator, Dr. Father uh, Anil and his team; Dr. Kurian; Dr. Jobi Thomas, Head of the Department, and all faculty members of the Chemistry Department. Finally, a big thanks to all the enthusiastic participants. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. Uh, we Thank will you. continue our discussions in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.